have a minister who in his genetic code higher education flows limitless. Professor Amun Murugira knows higher education. And I think that's why we're unlucky. Because you can't fool him. You can't fool him, he knows. He has produced documents. Um, if you Google, I don't know whether the ministry strategic plan is now on his website. If you read that plan, I think please try to see where our plan, as GZU dovetails his own plan. Because I can assure you, he is going to read your plan. He's not just going to look for Education 5.0. He's not just going to look at, yeah, there you are. He's not just going to look at whether you have included issues of heritage. Wherever he gives a speech, ladies and gentlemen, he talks about heritage. Very briefly, he says, Saudi Arabia's heritage is oil. What is Zimbabwe's heritage? We need to answer that question. The, the, the VC is giving us an idea. We need to answer that question. If we don't, we're in trouble. Number two, you have all seen the 2018 National Critical Skills Audit. 2018 National Critical Skills Audit. Every dean, every head of department, every professor, every associate professor, and every senior lecturer, and every lecturer, you must read that 2018 National Critical Skills Audit. Because he has mandated us that when an institution is putting its programs for accreditation, if they do not have, if they do not have anything that addresses if you are teaching business studies, you must first of all preface what you want to do by telling us like what he was saying to us. What is, what is the deficit in percentage terms in business studies? What is the deficit in percentage terms in law? What is the deficit or even surplus in engineering and in science, etc., etc. So that before you go to professors or go to the pro vice chancellor or to your dean and say, I want to introduce, I want to introduce this program, you have to do that in a particular context because there are critical shortages in certain disciplines. In other disciplines, there's a surplus, and we don't need that. We need to focus when the country is saying we should start. He's, he didn't tell you the percentage, but he was talking about it. Our literacy rate, and Professor Mogira talks about it every time, is 90, our literacy level is 96%. It's one of the highest in the world. But what do we, ladies and gentlemen? We import apples from Cape Town. Professor Mogira, he just reminded me, we even <coughs> import toothpicks. At lunch, Magwanama toothpicks, and we should know one an hour. They're being imported into the country. So I just wanted to preface my, my presentation you know, with, with these. So this is just a very brief overview of the objects of the Zinche Act and what we are supposed to be doing. We, we have to promote a particular kind of higher education in this country. And that particular kind of higher education is quality higher education. But it's not just quality higher education, it's very relevant higher education. So we are empowered by the act. If you come to us and that you are interested in the mechanical dynamics of how a lizard breaks its tail and generates another tail, we will tell you that we will not, we will not look at your program. You have to go back to the National Critical Skills Audit and that's your starting point. So we are mandated by the act. He was talking about research. I know he tried to be very diplomatic. He didn't want to go in there. He didn't want to go in there. We are right at the bottom of the ladder. We are at the bottom of the ladder in terms of research output globally. And the reason we are at the bottom of the ladder is that most of us are publishing in predatory journals. 
most of us are publishing in journals that you actually pay them to publish for you. If you see any journal that says, pay for your article, pay for your manuscript, you know, that journal is suspect. When you want to publish in the Harvard Journal, Harvard Business Review, they don't ask for your money. You have to disrupt what the, the, the VC was talking about. So what we are trying to do, I talked about it in our group, I can't see my members yet, my members are here. In our group, yes. One of the things we want to suggest to the minister is that we want to talk to our colleagues in South Africa. I've got a list on my computer of about 12,000 accredited journals in South Africa. 12,000 journals that are accredited. We want to talk to them and say, can we add our own list of accredited journals as the higher education sector in Zimbabwe? So that when you publish your article in one of those accredited journals, the ministry should give us some money that goes to that particular individual or to that particular institution. And the vice chancellor will say, this goes to the university, this goes to the faculty, this goes to the department, and this goes to the individual, so that you get something that comes into your pocket. But what we want, what we want, we want you to sweat. We want you to sweat. We want you to wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning and do your work. The true mark of an academic institution is an academic institution that you see people at five, at six, even on a Saturday working. In some institutions, if you go at five o'clock, the institution is virtually empty. It's virtually empty. There is no way, there is no way we can be creative and innovative if we work from eight to four thirty or from eight to five. So we're trying to put a carrot and also put a stick. So this is a discussion that we are going to have with the minister so that at least we can, we can motivate people to do research. We are at the bottom. One of the things, Prof. Skobo, that we are doing right now, which you like so much, is that we're talking to the Times Higher Education Supplement. The Times Higher Education Supplement. I used to be one of those that was completely against global rankings. But global rankings is a must. Professor Amon Murwira, and I think you talked about it a little bit. Professor Amon Murwira wants Zimbabwe to earn foreign currency from international or foreign students. That's what he wants. But a student from, a student from Malawi, when she wants to come to Great Zimbabwe University, they Google Great Zimbabwe University on the Shanghai ratings, on the Times Higher Education Supplement, and on the African one to see where GZU stands. If you are number 10,000, they won't come. So we are going to have a symposium sometime this year where we are going to invite the Times Higher Education Supplement to come and work with us, to come and talk to us, or now we can go on to these global rankings. Remember, even academics are ranked as well. So if we have to achieve the goal that Professor Mugira wants, GZU has to get either on the Times Higher Education rankings, global rankings, or on the Shanghai one, or on two, three others that we all know. And the paper, once you do that, it means the quality of your teaching, the quality of your research, Prof, I completely agree with you. The fact that you have got a PhD does not make you a better teacher. The fact that you have got a PhD does not make you know about pedagogy, about andrology, about eutagogy, and the epistemic discourses that undergird teaching and learning. You know your discipline, as Prof. Zubay said. I mean, if he, when he came back with a PhD from Edinburgh, went and did his grad CE, what intellectual justification do you have for not doing it? So one of the things, <laughs> yeah. so one of the things, colleagues, one of the things that we look at when we do a skills audit, because there are no secrets in Zimbabwe, the minister has asked us to do 
a schemes audit of one particular institution. You will soon know it because there will be no secrets in the country. We are starting next week. And one of the things we are going to look at is if you have got a PhD, do you have a teaching qualification? If you have got a master's degree, do you have a teaching qualification? The deans who are in here, the deans who are in here, one of the things I hope that you ask your faculties, I would like to see your pedagogical plan for your faculty. I'd like to see your pedagogical plan for your faculty. If you are in the law faculty, I want to know what is your teaching model in, 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 in law. And what kind of Zimbabwean or global theoretical perspectives undergird your teaching model. Like what you are trying to do, we could just, we could just ask this person, what teaching model are you using? What theoretical model are you using? <laughs> and, and people will stammer. People will stammer. So for us, research is going to be critical, colleagues. I want to leave this and go to this section. We have to advise the minister on all higher education matters. And we have to recommend policy on higher education, including the establishment of public institutions. And we have to accredit institutions of higher education. We, are def we want to develop a framework for accrediting institutions. So that one doesn't wake up tomorrow and say, I want to start a university. There are two institutions that three years ago they said, we want to start an institution. Up to this day, they, does, they don't even have a brick. So that shows there's something wrong. We have to recommend the minister, to the minister, on the design of institutional quality assurance system. What is the quality assurance system in Great Zimbabwe University? If I was a little bit older, I would have said, Deans, uh, can you tell us what is the quality assurance system in the Faculty of Law? What is the quality assurance in the Faculty of Applied and Social Sciences or in Science? What is your quality assurance system? So before we look at a national quality assurance system, we have to see at the micro level what the quality assurance systems are, because that's where the system builds up. And not on a regular basis, the university system, as you were saying, I won't say much about Education 5.0. The minister said to me, Mr. CEO, you and me were promoted on the basis of teaching, learning, and community engagement. Now what he's looking for, if you read one of those books that Prof. Scobo has, you'll notice in there there's a diagram. What he's moving into is that if you're a professor at GZU, you can qualify to be a professor at Mutare University of Science and Technology. You all know there are cases of people who moved from University 1, went to University 2 and said I'm a professor, and they say no. You are a senior lecturer. Go down to a senior lecture, or you leave. So what Professor Mungira is trying to say to us is that we have to work together and find a system that if I'm a professor at GZU, I can equally be a professor at UZ. I can equally be a professor at NASA. So that our systems are more or less the same. And how do we do that? We do that through a peer review mechanism. Colleagues? I have been an external reviewer for a number of universities in South Africa and two or three universities in the, in the United Kingdom. When you look at their requirements from a professor, for a professor, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. We don't want to emulate them. We want to have something that is homegrown. So that's why if you look at what Professor Mubira is trying to do, is trying to make sure that these systems are the same. We have to recommend to the minister institutional quality assurance standards, the establishment of standardization and accreditation of institutions of higher education, including standards of the physical plant and equipment. At the moment, we are really in the business of the preparation and amendment of university charters, and we are looking at your university charters. The university today, is it preparing students of the future 
Here is my simple example. There's a young lady who is the daughter of a friend of mine, and she wants to come to GZU to study psychology. So she's going to be 2019, 2020, 2021. Maybe in 2022 or 2023, she will go out there into the world of work. Who can tell me what the world will be like in 2023? Nobody can. So the question, Mr. Dean, of psychology is the program that this young lady is coming to do, to what extent can you say that it is going to prepare you for the world of work in 2023? Can we chat about this over tea, please? What am I, what am I talking about, colleagues? What am I talking about? I'm talking about the program qualification mix that this young lady is going to be exposed to in psychology. Is she going to be functional in 2023? So that's what we are looking at. When I come to you, luckily enough I may not come to most of you, but if I were to come, that's what I'll be looking for. I want you to tell me what is the world of work in Zimbabwe going to look like in 2023, so that this young lady is going to be functional. He had on one of his screens, Prof, with your permission, I'm going to ask you a question and want those of us that have read the fourth industrial revolution to raise your hands up. One, two, three. In fact, Klaus Schwab, the founder of the World Economic Forum, now has a new book that is, a, is taking the argument further. So colleagues, I'm, I was in the same room with my colleague from the, from the library. Can we order, can we order electronic versions of the fourth industrial revolution by Klaus Schwab? Can we order that book, please? Because colleagues, if you, if you haven't read that little book, which is talking about the world in 2030, in 2065, I don't know how you are preparing your students for the future. I don't know how you are making the university that the VC wants. The VC wants the university of the future. The university of the future is a university of the future where we think about 10, 15 years from now. Okay? We are also supposed to recommend to the minister institutional quality assurance for the standards for libraries. I'm very impressed by your library. It's, this is extremely impressive. I mean, the amount of e-resources that are here today it's impressive, and, and congratulations, um, the librarian. We, it's just excellent. That's impressive. Safety standards for labs and workshops. I'll tell you briefly. When I was in the institution that I was in South Africa, I was the vice principal of the institution, but I was also in charge of teaching and learning. So one day, students in chemistry, chemistry students. They went on strike, and they said they're not going to school, they're not going to class, they're not going to the lab, until we have a certificate from the Minister of Health that says the extruders and all the labs in chemistry, they've got a certificate that they're safe. So you know what they did? They said, Mr. D.V. Seeker, come and see what it looks like. So I went and stood. I went and stood at the door of one of the labs. And you know what they did? Six of them came in and they locked the door. They said, we now want you to experience what you've been experiencing. Mm -hmm. So I was there for a few hours. I was there for a few hours. I told them I have to take medication. They said, no, we're not interested. You'll be here. So one of the things that we're very interested, colleagues, is to look at what you, you are doing. We have got plans that are underway for minimum standards for student housing. You know, the minister has given us a blank check to say we should have build, operate, and transfer, public-private partnerships. We don't have a document that you can go out there and say, even if people have said we've got houses, 
the dean of students, do we have a dean of students in here? Yes. The dean of students cannot show me a document that is either a government document or a university sector document that says these are the minimum norms and standards of student housing, whether it's a house or a flat or a block of flats or something very big. So one of the things we are going to do, we are going to work with you and your colleagues so that we develop something. If you Google the DHET in South Africa, they have probably a 50, 60 page document that even talks about what a toilet for a wheelchair user looks like. That talks to space maximum standard that's required for a small room where a student can study. That's what we are looking for, so that we can standardize what we are talking about. We have to, this is excellent, Prof, I'm so happy that we, we have now as a country you know, done a lot in terms of student transfer between programs and institutions. Um, we haven't finished, we haven't finished developing our minimum bodies of knowledge. Some disciplines have finished, but other disciplines have not completed. I think for us to be a quality higher education system, these minimum bodies of knowledge have to be complete so that a degree in computer science at GZU is 80% the same, 70 to 80% the same to one at GZ. <coughs> then obviously the 30 or 20% will be the difference so that you bring your context in. So once we have that, it means the issues of the portability of credits, the transferability of students from one institution to the other, you know, becomes very easy. But again, we are going to work with all of you to put this in place. One of, the, one of the key issues that I'm very interested in at the moment is really to advise the minister on funding arrangements of higher education institutions. In, this, in the system that I'm coming from, universities are funded on the basis of full-time equivalents your throughput or past rates, and your head counts. In other words, the money that you would have gotten for 2019 would be based on your throughput rates and your past rates on 2017, on actual bodies of students that passed and that went through the system. So we want to have a discussion with the minister together with the VCs so that at least there's money that comes into the institutions. But that money has to come in terms of the quality graduates and the quality outputs and the quality of the graduates that you have produced as characterized by your FTEs and your headcounts, or the FTE and headcount ratio, so that we begin to develop a nuanced funding mechanism you know, for, for the country. Um, and to assist institutions in higher education in the training of higher caliber of staff postgraduate training. Colleagues, from one institution to the other in this country, there are different models of postgraduate training. I went to a graduation ceremony, not of GZU. I went to a graduation ceremony of University X. A colleague of mine, on his own, was the supervisor of six PhD students. On his own, on his own, listen carefully, on his own. So what it means to us is that the quality in some institutions of our masters and PhD students is not a very good quality. So we have to discuss, we have to discuss ladies and gentlemen, whether we like it or not. There are two basic models, the Anglo-Saxon British model of where you do your master's or your PhD by research. And in some cases, you've got one or two supervisors. And in the American model, where you do your master's degree or your PhD by coursework, and you have got a doctoral and master's committee of three to five people, and obviously a viva at the end. So we have to carve out a Zimbabwe model of higher education training, especially for the masters and the doctoral. This is why you see 
Some of us who have got PhDs and master's degrees, when Professor Jobo says you head this academic department, we fail this man because Atina kuikwa, chikore chacho akana. And the reason why chikore chacho chisipo is because we did not go deep into our discipline. Mr. Librarian, can we please order? And that book is now very, very cheap. Thomas Kuhn's A Theory of Scientific Revolutions. Do we, how many copies do we have now? I wanted to refer to earlier one, the fourth industrial revolution by Klaus I've just sent it to the mailing group. I've downloaded it. I'll take you to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take you to lunch. Colleagues, just why should you read the fourth industrial revolution? Some of the things he's saying, obviously, we can interrogate and we can question them. But he's trying to talk about the world of the future. Professor Zobo knows. In April, I go for a meeting in Moscow. I sit on a UNESCO board. And what do we do, colleagues? We spend three days looking at the role of ICTs in higher education up to 2063. I won't be around in 2063. In fact, all of us, there are 10 of us, one of them is your colleague, the, the Vice Chancellor of the Smart University in Dubai, is the chairman of the board. We won't be around. So Klaus Schwab in that book, that's what he's talking about. He's saying what is the world of work going to look in 2025? What professions will disappear in 2025? What professions will emerge in 2025? That's what academics should be doing on a daily basis. So when I'm looking at the issues of graduate training, that's what we are looking at. So we are going to come to you so that we look at these two models. Not to copy the two, but develop a Zimbabwean model of postgraduate training, especially at the master's and the doctoral level. To promote equity in access, and obviously to promote international cooperation, I'm very impressed, Professor. In the group that I was, you've got a lot of linkages you know, with um, international universities. Um, and I'm glad now we've opened the door with Michigan State University so that you know we, we can we can work with them but here is the nature of our environment and he talked about it. the nature of the higher education environment is volatile the nature of the higher education is uncertain no one knows really what the future is like i hope my colleagues my colleagues in business in the study of business and economics and social studies i hope you are offering a course to your students or even seminars to your students on futures research. If you Google futures research on your computer, you will see what that is all about. It's research about the future. The future. It's research about thinking about the future. We are saying our world is also changing very, very fast. The only constant now is change. And we are saying it's ambiguous. One of my most favorite quotes is from Albert Einstein in 1937. He said, I never think of the world and I never think of the future because the future is here and now. So that is our world and the question is, what are we doing in higher education? Did you talk about the blue washing strategy? No, he didn't talk about the blue washing strategy. I'm sure that was an oversight. What is required? What is required is for us to adopt what these two people, uh, Kim and um, the other name, I can't pronounce it, but you know, the reference is there. We have to adopt a blue ocean strategy. What does it say? Value innovators create products or services for which they are no direct competitors. Don't go and compete with UZ for students in economics. Don't do that. Because they've done it since 1955. Don't go and compete with NAST in electronic engineering. Go into the world of graphene. I don't know who is the dean of science. Who is the dean of science? Dean of science. Let us go into graphene. You and me know what is graphene, but the, some of our colleagues may not know. <laughs> you and me know. For those of us that do not know, 
Because this is the future. What we need to do? We need to change GZU from inside out. If you change it from inside out, then you move it forward. So that's what these people are saying. What factors should be reduced well below industry standards? What factors should be eliminated that we have taken for granted? What it is that we're taking for granted that we should eliminate? What factors should be created that higher education has never thought of? Ask yourself right now. I want you to ask yourselves right now. What is it that you have introduced to GZU which has never been thought of by other people in your own area of specialization? Professor Shogo and myself, we said we introduced Zinte. He developed Utare Teachers College. His legacy is there at, at, at MSU. He's going to leave a legacy at GZT. What is your legacy? What is it that you've introduced that is new? Show me, show I was just telling Mr. Mangai that if I don't do anything for the next five years, at least when my friend comes to make his eulogy at my grave, he'll say, well, here lies a man who was the founding vice chancellor of the Zimbabwe Open University. Ah, yeah. Okay, that's what, that's what he said. That's what he's going to say. But on a serious note, colleagues, you can't wake up every morning and come to work for 365 days and you haven't produced something that is new, something that is creative. Something that is innovative, something that is outside the ordinary. Even in terms of your teaching. We were talking in my group that for us to bring about ICTs into GZU, form follows function. Form follows function. What is the form that we're going to put in place to drive the introduction of ICTs in teaching and learning? Most of us were talking of ICTs and teaching and learning, and I said in my group, the discourse of a blended mode of teaching and learning is absent. Why is it absent? You must think, okay? And obviously the idea, and that's your source, colleagues. <laughs> There you are. What, what were you doing? You, you know, I keep saying the creative mind must then be subdued. If it doesn't bother you that you have been creative in a day, then you have a huge problem. Because if you don't, if you don't create something that you can remember uh, a year from now then you really haven't existed. That's true. That's what it means. You have been walking years, but you haven't existed. So, and you see, colleagues, what he's saying is, what, this is what he's saying in different ways. What intellectual justification do you have to call yourself Dr. So and so and Professor so and so? What intellectual justification do you have? There's no intellectual justification. I mean, when I was younger, as Vice Chancellor of Zoe, if you came to my office and you say you want your salary to be increased, I would say, show me why I should increase your salary. And I hope, Mr. Dr. Magaya, you talked of IPM as Individual Performance Management System. I hope this RBM talks to Individual Performance Management System that says, out of five, if you get anything below three, you don't get, you don't get a bonus. Why should you get a bonus when you are mediocre? Why should you get a bonus when you are average? Why should you get a bonus when you are pedestrian? You shouldn't. But if you get 3.1, 3.2 up to five, then you get a bonus. Because then you are making a difference. I know some of you will complain, but you know, that's, that's where it should be. I wish if you could see this. So I don't want to talk about it because I'm going to leave these slides so that you can see these slides for yourselves. I'm not going to talk about it. But Mr. Dean of Science, Mr. Dean of Arts, what is your change model when the VC said in Senate, we want you to move this institution ahead? What is your change model? 
What is your change model that an undergraduate student can say, I know in science this is where we want to go. I know in social studies this is where we want to go. I know in law that this is where we want to go. If I Google now, can I go to the GZU website and go to the Faculty of Law and see what their change model is? That's what we're trying to say. But I'll leave this so that at least you can you can have a you can have a look at it. But what what I'm saying is that the client call for education 5.0 talks to what you know, what you know, what you know, and what you know. Mr. Dean of Arts, Dean of Science, how many papers were published in 2019? that critically looked at our teaching and learning model at GZU? How many papers were published based on reflexive research on teaching and learning? One of the, co one of the things that we talk in education, why our students are not performing the way they are doing, is the whole issue of language, the language for teaching and learning. That whole area we call epistemological access which implicates what we call cognitive dissonance. Most of us, most of us, myself in particular, when I answer a question, usually in nanoseconds, I translate into Shona, yes. think in Shona, and then quickly translate back into English. We call that cognitive dissonance. So the question is, how many studies took place last year on teaching and learning and student support and focused on issues of cognitive distance and epistemological access. Don't answer this question publicly. But I want you to answer this question in your next departmental meeting or in your next faculty board meeting. What kind of research on teaching is taking place? Okay, to be able to inform education 5.0 and innovation.